So for today, um, it's a little bit different from some of the, from from the other class periods. Um, it's not really like a formal sort of lecture. Um, Throughout the course, we've had all of these autobiographies, um, and the, the goal for these autobiographies, the reason that I've included so many of them in the class, is um, because I hope that they provide everybody with a perspective on these different diseases, um, and a perspective on what it's like to have them, what the treatments are like, what the sort of sequence of events that people go through, uh, and so on. Um, and the autobiographies, I think, are fantastic, and, um, and represent um, I think in a, a variety of different sort of severities of diseases um, that people have gone through with these. Um, and, uh, but there, there's a little bit of a selection uh, toward in the autobiographies in the sense that um, uh, people with sort of moderate symptoms don't tend to write a whole autobiography about their experience with their mental illness. Um, and there's also um, uh, uh, an extent to which, um, for reasons that are that make a lot of sense, and I don't and I don't have any um, uh, I, I don't fault anybody who doesn't like you know share everything about their their illness. Um, but but uh, people who have sort of mild mental illness also often uh, prefer not to discuss it uh, publicly, and I totally understand that. Um, and so for today, um, rather than having an autobiography for this unit about anxiety and depression, um, I just was going to share with all of you my experiences with anxiety and depression um, from, well, that have been ongoing for the last, uh, well, my whole life really, but um, especially for the last 12 years or so, um, and sort of the, the, the personal trajectory that I've had there. Um, and just like with the other, other autobiographies, the, the point of this is to provide you with um, a perspective on the diseases. Um, this is by no means everybody's experience. In fact, everybody's experience with any mental illness is different from anybody else's experience with the same mental illness. Um, and, uh, and actually, a big part of the reason why I chose to share my story rather than have another story um, that's, uh, that's out there is because my story is, I think, pretty common and pretty, in a sense, um, uh, sort of mundane. Um, there have been some, some sort of significant events in my life sur surrounding my experience with anxiety and depression, um, but it's... Um, but, you know, statistically speaking, uh, uh, about a quarter of the population at some point will experience mental illness. So there are 45 people in this room, so that means 12 or so people in this room at some point in their life will experience mental illness. Um, probably there are, just statistically speaking, six or seven people who already have had significant experiences with mental illness. And again, sort of statistically speaking, I would bet that there are people in this room who've had more significant experiences and have had more sort of um, personal dramatic experiences with mental illness than I myself have had. Um, and so the reason that I'm sharing my story is not because it's exceptional, but actually because it's very common, I think. Um, and again, you know, everybody's story is a little bit different. Um, and so, um, and actually another reason or another sort of important fact about mental illness that, um, that may or may not have come up once or twice in this class before, but I think is an important thing to be aware of, is that um, of that quarter of people that have experiences with mental illness, um, more than half, typically around two-thirds, don't seek help for it. And again, there are a variety of different reasons associated with that and reasons for that and social pressures and so on. Um, actually, uh, there's um, a lot of work that's going on uh, at CMU with the group Active Minds, if anybody's heard of them, um, where they've, uh, the, the, just earlier this semester, they had the, the um, across the CFA lawn, all of these backpacks for the Sin Silence Packing exhibit, um, trying to bring mental illness out into the open. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a cold today on top of, uh, on top of this, but... Um, uh, and, and I think that that's a really valuable thing to, to raise general sort of public awareness of mental illness and the commonality of it. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's sort of something that uh, I understand why people don't, uh, are, are sort of afraid to seek help. And in fact, part of my story relates to my own reluctance to seek help. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I think it's still uh, important to be aware of the stories that people have out there. Um, 
So, uh, and, and actually related to that, this is, this is an excerpted quote from Ken Steele uh, from, the, uh, from the book that you all are in the process of reading, the schizophrenia book, um, in which he writes uh, that we need to have people understand our illness. He's talking about schizophrenia, but, um, but I think this applies to a lot of different illnesses. Uh, and he says that if somebody falls down from a heart attack, people rush for help, they'll call an ambulance, but if they see somebody stumbling in the street and appearing disoriented and maybe talking to themselves, um, they just sort of avoid the person. And he thinks of this as an issue of stigmatization. Um, and you know, while while um, it's true that that people um, that that um, that you may, for personal safety reasons, not want to confront somebody who's in the middle of a psychiatric episode, um, knowing how to seek help is very valuable. And actually, there are a lot of resources available on campus as well to sort of help you figure out how to manage these sort of things appropriately. Um, but uh, but there there's a hu huge number of people in uh, in mental illnesses. Uh, and, and, sorry, in, in in jail with mental illness, um, and uh, and community care can really help to alleviate some of that. Um, and uh, he discusses how um, a big challenge facing uh, the, the, the government is how to turn the mental health system into something that people actually want to use um, and sort of decreasing the stigma associated with mental illness um, to encourage people to seek help and, um, and see that help as potentially useful. Um, so, you know, in terms of kind of my own story and my own history with, with mental illness, um, to those of you who know me, uh, uh, you pro it probably isn't a surprise to know that I'm a little bit of a kind of shy person. Um, I may have a strange job for somebody who's a shy person, but um, but it, it you know I, I make it work for myself um, hope, most of the time, hopefully anyway. Um, but uh, but you know the, like my experiences um, are very much captured by this you know this sort of constant internal monologue like what's appropriate way when should I talk in this conversation? Okay, wait, if I looking in the person uh, you know do I avoid eye contact? Do I look in the person's eyes? Am I being too like is it too weird that I'm looking in the person's eyes? Like there's all this sort of like constant internal monologuing going on um, and in addition to that since I was I don't know like well actually if you ask my mom since the day I was born I was an insomniac um, and she'll happily tell you about um, uh, about uh, the the um, five minutes most at a time that I slept as an infant um, but uh, but you know uh, for, for my entire life uh, uh, difficulty sleeping has been a part of, 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 uh, of my life uh, and I've and you know I've, I've been to doctors and uh, been on pretty much every sleep aid at one point or another that, that you can imagine um, to sort of help with the insomnia. Um, but uh, um, but my, um, my own sort of experiences with mental illness um, and with sort of depression and anxiety um, as an illness um, were something that I sort of wasn't even personally aware of as such until um, until much later in my life, um, and you know everybody goes through times in their life where they sort of face challenges and things become overwhelming. Um, for me, the, the that time as as I'll sort of talk about in a little bit came up uh, not during college, um, but after I finished college and when I finished graduate school, um, uh, when I had uh, so I mean sort of the short version of it is that uh, I. Um, I knew, you know, when I graduated college, I was 100% certain that I was going to be this famous researcher and I was going to solve everything there was to do about the brain. Um, and then graduate school ended up being a really difficult time for me because the ups and downs of research um, just sort of wore on me a lot. Um, and that's not everybody's experience. Um, there are plenty of people who find that they can sort of work with the ups and downs of research. Um, but for me, that was just sort of really exhausting um, and, and ended up causing a pretty significant episode of anxiety and depression. Um, but before I talk about that, I just, um, well, yeah, I guess a little bit, a little bit about that. Um, so, um, you know, my experiences are sort of my, my visions of graduate school were sort of related to uh, more something along the lines of this where, you know, uh, I, I would be, you know, solving these great problems and answering these great questions about how, um, how the brain works and understanding everything about, um, about uh, what was, you know, what's, um, 
uh, what, how consciousness be behaves and everything like that. Um, but uh, the, sort of, uh, the sort of tedium of graduate school and tedium of research um, for me was something that it turned out I didn't like. Um, and again, that's not an everybody experience. Um, there's a lot of tedium in everything that you do. Um, and uh, and um, that doesn't mean that graduate school, I, I think that there, there are a lot of people who do wonderfully well in graduate school. Um, there was plenty of tedium in my wife's experience in graduate school, um, but for her it wasn't as exhausting uh, personally as it was for me. Um, yeah, and so uh, um, when I, while I was in graduate school, um, it took, I had many sort of ups and downs, many sort of, uh, uh, more downs than ups, it felt like, um, where I, uh, I felt like um, I wasn't getting anywhere with my research. And I, and I tried to replicate multiple studies. They all failed. Um, and I don't know whether that's a failing on the part of the published research or a failing on my part. Um, although I can say that there were a few things that I tried to replicate or I tried to do, and I couldn't get them to work. And then Six years later, somebody published a paper showing exactly what I'd been trying to do for five, for five or six months or a year. Um, and so I think that for me, for whatever reason, um, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't sort of as invested as I'd hoped to be in the work that I was doing. And that really made it harder for me to, to do well at what I was doing. Um, but I did end up you know, finally pu publishing my thesis work. Um, and, that, um, um, and that was... Um, an exhausting experience to get through. And by the end of it, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I was just um, really kind of at a complete loss. I was sick of doing research. I had spent all this time sort of planning on being this famous scientific researcher. Um, and um, at the time, I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll go to medical school and um, you know, just you know, use my biology background that way, and I can, I could, maybe I'd be a great doctor, um, and uh, or maybe I should. Uh, I looked into like nursing programs and science writing programs and all this stuff, um, and so to me, I feel like th there are always times that everybody has in their lives when you realize that where you are and where you're headed isn't quite where you sort of want to be. And I had put myself on this trajectory toward being this famous researcher. And it was apparent to me that that wasn't going to be the case. And that was incredibly distressing for me because I would put all this work into it. Um, and so I had all these ideas, okay, well, you know, go to medical school, go to be a, be a, maybe be a nurse, maybe be a science writer. I don't know what to do. Um, and I don't have any, like, great advice about what to do universally in those situations. But there is a tension that exists between sort of the trajectory that you're on and the what you want to be. And that's not always the case, right? Sometimes you're headed exactly toward what you want to be, which is great. Um, but everybody's going to have times where it's whether, you know, whether it's a relationship you're in or whether it's your career or whatever, where the where you are or where, where you're headed isn't lining up with where you want to be. Um, and sometimes the right thing to do is just to throw out, is just to, to you know, cut your losses with where you are and move fully toward where you want to be. And I wish I could say that, like, you should just always follow your heart and do that. Um, but I don't think that that's necessarily always the best option. Um, it l lends to the possibility of sort of chasing things too much and never focusing on one thing for too long. Um, on the other hand, I also sort of wish I could say um, that, that, you know, whenever these things come up, you should always just sort of stick with where you are and stay on the, stay the course with what you've done and everything like that. Um, but that's, of course, not a great plan either, because if, you're, if where you're headed is not where you want to be headed, then, then a change might be needed. And so for me, I kind of settled, I kind of ended up moving toward a teaching career um, as a compromise between where I had already sort of put myself headed toward and where I, um, and where I, um, 
uh, and, and, and where I you know, kind of really wanted to be, which at the time was sort of, okay, well, just go dump this PhD thing, go do something else entirely. Um, and that ended up working out well for me, uh, sort of compromise. That doesn't mean that that's always the right solution for everybody, but anyway, for me, that's sort of where I went with that. Um, but the journey from, from sort of here when I finished graduate school and was, and was in this crisis about what am I going to do with my life and, um, and getting to a place where I had a career that I was, reason that I was that I'm very happy with um, was, was not necessarily a straightforward thing. Um, so, um, and, and you know, th there's, there's this challenge too that I had. So, so you know, I, it, it, when I finished graduate school, I knew that things weren't where I wanted them to be, and I didn't quite know what I wanted to do yet. Um, and I was, um, I, I, I was having, I, it came to a point maybe six months after I finished graduate school where like, I just couldn't keep repressing anymore this, this tension that I was feeling about where I wanted to be. And I just, like, I just shut down. And, there was a good week to a month where I was just literally like day and night sweating bullets. I couldn't pick up a piece of paper without it getting wet from the sweat coming off of my hands. Um, I kept myself hydrated. I barely ate. I had just like practically no sleep for that three week period. Um, and uh, I, was, I mean, couldn't go to work. I was just a complete and total wreck um, during that time. Um, fortunately, my, uh, my boss at the time was really supportive um, and helped me to, um, to find a therapist who was really helpful and sort of helped to put me um, sort of back toward the road to recovery. But one of the things that was really the hardest for me about all of this is sort of is kind of captured in this. This is a this is a comic. I like the XKCD, so you see a lot of this today. Um, I, I, um, uh, this is about cancer and about sort of you know um, uh, how how positive attitudes can be and can be sort of good for your um, immune system and so on and sort of help you fight cancer. And, and there's a lot of evidence to indicate the positive attitudes good for your physical health as well as your mental health. Um, and that's all very true. Um, but um, but it's also really hard, um, at least for me, it was really hard to sort of know that all of this thing, that all of this trouble was in some sense in my mind, because I felt like I should have some control over that, and um, and that made it even more. Um, even more sort of distressing and debilitating for me, um, and sort of fed on this this cycle of of, um, of worthless feelings that I was having, because I, I you know it, it, if only I would feel better, then I would feel better, and and that's and that's sort of the the feeling that I had, and um, and it's very hard. Um, first of all. For me, very very hard to sort of recognize that there are things that I didn't have control over within my own mind at that time, and even still now at times. Um, and um, and also, um, you know, it's 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 just uh, like. It's hard too for people who who haven't been through periods of severe depression or other forms of mental illness to recognize um, how challenging it is and the the extent to which it can make it so that you know like literally getting up out of bed just isn't an option for a uh, for a day and like how is that the case right like you know it's 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 hard for me to imagine now a day when I would wake up and I couldn't get out of bed but at the time that was some of what was going on. Um, and so, and so it's, it's, um, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's hard to sort of express and explain that, um, to people who haven't experienced it, but it's, it's like, you know, severe grief, but that lasts for weeks and weeks and that there's no identifiable cause for, and that becomes also extremely, um, extremely sort of self-perpetuating. 
So, um, so anyway, uh, you know, that was, that was all going on for me. And there was a, so there was this month long period where I basically couldn't get up out of bed and c couldn't hardly do anything. Um, but I, but I did manage to get myself to see the, th this therapist. I started, um, uh, seeing, I, I saw a couple of different psychiatrists. The first one, um, gave me some, some, uh, some, uh, some, what was it? Uh, s some sort of really strong SNRI drug that just completely knocked me out. Um, and, um, and for me, it wasn't really, wasn't really working. I was on it for a month and a half, and it just wasn't really, uh, wasn't really working. Um, so I went and saw a different, uh, a different psychiatrist, and uh, he started me on what I've been on since, which is um, Lexapro, which is an SSRI that's like Celexa. And um, and at the time, a sort of moderate dose of uh, of clonazepam, which is a benzodiazepine. Um, these days, I typically take just kind of a low dose every day of that, um, and that sort of you know for me is what my body needs to keep functioning. I've actually tried a few times to sort of take take myself off of the medication, sort of feeling like, okay, well, I've got all these other tools. I've developed this. Uh, so, so I have you know cognitive behavioral therapy that I practice, uh, mindfulness meditation that I practice. I sort of start thinking, well, okay, those things are sort of taking over. I don't need the medication. And I've tried going off the medication, and then I always end up anxious and and uh, and in these ruminating uh, periods. And so for me. I feel like the medication is sort of what my body needs to just function properly, and that's that's what I do. Um, again, sort of everyone's experience is different. Um, but so so I um, I was I was I was I had started on these medications, and after a few months, I, I was um, making some progress with my therapist, sort of discussing a lot of the anxiety actually centered around this idea that I had screwed up. My uh, my thesis work, and that this publication that I'd made, that was sort of the cornerstone of my PhD, was um, was wrong, and that we'd messed up and left out some critical control. And I was convinced, completely convinced, that any day now somebody was going to figure out that I'd left out this critical control, and they were going to come and take away my PhD, and I was going to lose all that I'd worked for, and my wife was going to leave me because of it, and and all of this, and I would, you know. It sounds a little bit unbelievable now, but I, I knew, I knew that that was going to happen. I was as sure of that as I was of anything. Um, actually, in some period, there were some periods where I had some delusions that went even beyond that, um, to the point that I thought that my thesis advisor was, um, was an actor portraying a, a, P, a, a PhD person. And there were even times when I thought my wife was an actress portraying somebody who she didn't really actually love me. Um, there turns out there's a name for that. It's called the Truman Show Delusion. Who's seen the Truman Show movie? So there was actually, yeah, that was, I actually had that for a period of time. For like a month and a half, I was convinced that I was like in a world surrounded by actors and everyone was just filming me and I wasn't mm -hmm. in on the whole thing. So anyway, which is not, um, which is not, Super common with depression, but it turns out that depression, this is, um, depression with psych psychotic features is what I had at the time, and that's um, you know not super common, but 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 not completely rare either with depression. Um, and as we'll talk about when we talk about schizophrenia, it's less severe than schizoaffective disorder, which is um, which is sort of like all of the hallmarks of schizophrenia. This is just some delusions that were um, non-trivial, but not as severe as schizophrenia. I don't have schizophrenia. I've never had. Yeah, so, anyway. um, you know, uh, yeah. And so, um, and, and so, as I was sort of starting to come out of this, um, uh, there was a time, maybe six months after the whole thing started, when I was starting to feel better. You know, maybe like starting to see friends again a little bit more. Uh, but a lot of my close friends knew about some about what I'd been going through, um, and there was there was one night in particular. When I was mostly out of kind of the worst of the experience, um, I wasn't sort of feeling this constant, you know, panic, this constant, unbelievable, crushing anxiety. But I still had these feelings that, like, in the long term, nothing's going to work out. In the long term, I'm not going to be successful. I haven't figured out what my career is going to be. I'm just trying this teaching thing because it's like a thing to do. Because what else am I going to do with my PhD if I'm not doing research? And um, and so I um, 
Uh, and so there was there was one evening when um, uh, the our two closest friends, um, uh, another uh, another married couple uh, that that uh, they were close friends with my wife and I, <coughs> excuse me, um, came over for dinner. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we were talking for a little while and sort of like kind of having a good time. It was, a, it was almost kind of nice how sort of normal the dinner was. Um, there was one point in the middle of the dinner when I started sort of having more feelings of anxiety and, uh, and concerns about the future. Um, and so I, uh, and so I excused myself and went to the, went to the bathroom and took, uh, maybe like four of the clonopin pills, which is, Probably a little bit more than I was supposed to take at the time, but um, uh, but you know a few of them just sort of helped me calm down. Um, then I came back and joined them, and then uh, and then you know they stayed for dinner, and then they said good night and they left. Um, and then my wife went to bed, and I was um, and I was really um, you know still sort of having these feelings about long term what's going to happen, um, and long term you know certainty that you know, I was just, I was just going to fail at the next thing I tried and fail at the next thing I tried and it was going to be this huge burden to my wife and um, and you know maybe you know we were thinking about having kids in a few years and I wasn't going to be able to help her take care of the kids because I'm just going to be this constant wreck um, and so I decided that night um, after she'd gone to bed that I was just going to take the rest of the bottle of clonopin. Um, and so I sat down to, um, to write a note um, explaining to her how I was going to be this burden and why um, she was better off without me and why um, this was, you know, I, I know this is going to be hard for you when you wake up in the morning and discover this, but, but, um, but you know, trust me, you'll be better off um, kind of thing. And, um, and... I wrote the letter and sort of read back over it, and I felt like I didn't quite capture right what I had wanted to say to her. Um, and at the time, I said, "Okay, well, it's I, I can do this another day." And so I said, "You know, I can do this another time." Um, so, and, and I just, I didn't, uh, another day I'll be able to write better, another day I'll be able to explain this better, and so I put the note away, I didn't end up taking the pills, I had had them right there next to me, but I didn't end up taking the pills, um, and um, probably, actually, a big part of why I didn't end up taking the pills also was the fact that I'd taken a few before, which is a little bit strange and ironic and not recommended um, to, um, as, as a way to, uh, you know, manage this. But for me, um, the little, the edge of the anxiety came off because of those, uh, those first few pills that I'd taken. Um, and so, um, and, and, but, you know, at the time, it just was like, okay, it was kind of like writer's block was the thing that, that, that saved me um, that night. Um, but, uh, and, so, and so after that, um, I, I started to, there, there were still times for the next few months when I would sort of think about uh, coming back to the bottle of pills and coming back to, to writing a note to my wife. Um, I ended up never again getting that close to doing it. Um, and so this all happened, I suppose I should have said, this all happened, it all sort of began, oh, 2008 sometime, so what was that, eight years ago? Um, and, um, and since about mid-2009, I haven't had any sort of severe depressive suicidal thoughts. I have had feelings of worthlessness and guilt that pop up from time to time and occasionally sort of come close to or meet the criteria for a major depressive episode. Um, but, but those sort of severe thoughts, um, I, I never had. Um, again since then and so um you know but 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 for over the next couple of months i did have them occasionally but never really felt the need to um to uh to to sort of move forward with them again um and so uh yeah and so um and and then and then so, so you know sort of coming out of this um, over those next few few months, and one of the questions that my wife always asked me about that was, you know, was that you? Was that really you who was who was the person doing that? Um, and for me, um, 
I mean, it feels like it still was me, right? I mean, it's sort of like in the Triggered book where he says that, yeah, it kind of was me, but it was sort of a broken version of me. Um, um, it really, you know, anxiety is always a part of who I am. It doesn't feel like it was happening to somebody else. It definitely was me who was there. Um, but since sort of managing my illness since then, I've been able to, um, to keep it kind of under control to the point that I don't have these, these severe episodes. I haven't had anything close to that severity of an episode lately. Um, and so um, this is uh, a quote taken from the, um, from the uh, uh, Unquiet Mind book um, that, you, uh, that you recently finished reading. Um, and you know, it, it captures, I think, a lot of what I feel also. Like, um, I, I, I don't ever expect to live without mental illness. I'm not even sure that I would really want to live without any anxiety at all. Um, I would probably never accomplish anything if I didn't have some sort of anxiety helping me move. The severity that I had is something I can manage to go without again. Um, but, but, um, but for me, I mean, it's, it's, it's a constant disease. That is a sort of chronic disease that requires constant monitoring. Um, but it's not, but it's something that's so sort of integral and so sort of um, fundamental to to my personality that I can't really imagine existing without it um, entirely, and it's something that instead I just I just try to manage. And for me, having anxiety and depression as a sort of constant companion in my life um, means that I'm always reminded of how lucky I am in some sense to, to be alive. Um, but, but um, you know, the, 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 the remissions, the resurgences, the upticks that come um, all sort of just serve for me now as a reminder of, um, of the value in enjoying time with my kids, in enjoying time with my family, in enjoying as much as I can everything that I do in a day. And I think that that is really, um, in a sense, uh, 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 a gift for me to have. It's not, you know, I wouldn't want to have, I wouldn't want anybody to have to go through the periods of, of trouble that I've been through. And again, I know that there are many, many people who've gone through way, way more severe um, uh, experiences and still made it out than I have. Um, but. Um, um, but I don't, um, but, but I, 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 you know, having the reminders actually I think sort of, for, na for me, since I'm able to now manage my disease, um, the reminders actually serve to sort of help me remember to value the time that I have and the joy that I do have. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is a, a picture from, um, from an artist, uh, uh, Sherry Wolfgang, here's another one. Um, um, and one of the reasons why I, I like this picture, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I don't like about this picture is that I, or that I, that I kind of disagree with about this picture is hope is not just a pill. In fact, for many people, hope is not even a pill at all. There are, there are diseases for which we don't have good medications or for which the side effects of medications outweigh the benefits. Um, but when I, having been through some, some really difficult times in terms of mental illness, um, sometimes you know, sometimes getting out of bed is not a choice. Sometimes, um, you know, facing the world and having a conversation with, with people is just not an option. Um, but, um, but wanting things to be better than they are, even if you feel that things are currently in an awful state, is something that I think everyone can choose. Um, and even if you feel like you have no power to make things better, um, you can at least have the power to want things to be better. And that's something that um, you know, I hope people um, uh, can, can recognize. And I wish that everybody knew that at least the power to hope for something better um, exists within all of us. Um, and yeah, um, 
So I guess you know, a couple papers that have come out that have also tried to refute my graduate work, um, which has been uh, a, another kind of set of reminders, um, but also do again sort of serve to remind me of what I've been through and what's um, and and you know what I have to still enjoy in my life, um, and you know what. So so this this um, this picture here uh, uh, is, she, this is a woman who actually, I didn't, I've, I've never met her, but she teaches now at the place where I was an undergraduate at Rice University in Houston. Um, and, uh, and so she points out sort of the ups and downs, she has a job very much like I do, teaching. Um, and she points out the ups and downs of teaching, which it does have its ups and downs and its joys and its, its sort of challenges. Um, and you know, if, if, you, if you say, okay, so, somebody with anxiety, severe anxiety, and they either can be in a lab where they're going to work sort of on a project day in and day out, or have a job where their job is to stand up in front of 40 people at a time and talk about, um, about uh, you know, this and that and present research papers and you know, manage discussions and all the stuff that I try to do with my daily work. You know, what, on the face of it, it sounds like the, the life in a lab is really sort of the, 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 the trajectory for somebody with my, with my sort of mental health um, uh, fingerprints. Um, but it, it, it's not the right job for me. And so for me, what I take that to mean is that a mental illness does not need to be a limitation any more than, uh, you know, um, uh, liking, um, uh, or maybe then, then um, not liking uh, physics needs to be a limitation. You know, um, it's something that it's important to understand about yourself. And if you uh, and if you have a mental illness, or for me having a mental illness, that doesn't mean that I can't do a job. Hopefully, that I can't do a job where it requires sort of putting myself in a public position on a regular basis, um, as long as um, it sort of works with um, the other aspects of my personality. Um, and so I guess kind of the point that I put, up this, put this up for is that for me, mental illness, I feel, doesn't need to be sort of a, pers a sort of permanent limitation. Um, and then this is from another book that was recommended on the list, but um, but didn't uh, wasn't one of the ones that you're required to read. Um, but one of the reasons that I that I put this up, um, a couple things. Um, first of all, one of the things in thinking back about what happened with me, I never told my wife, I never told my psychiatrist, I never told the social worker I was working with about the feelings of suicide that I was having, and that is really weird to me. If I had cancer and I go to see a doctor and they give me some medications and they say, okay, this is the medication and by the way, with the kind of cancer you have, there's a chance that someday you'll wake up and it's gonna metastasize in your hip. And if that happens, we've gotta get you into the hospital right away. We're gonna get your whole family down here. You're gonna to need to find a bone marrow donor. We're probably gonna to have to give you an artificial hip and, you know, but it's either that or you're going to die from the cancer. I guarantee you, if a doctor told me that, the second I wake up with the tiniest pain in my hip, I am calling the doctor, I'm telling my wife, I'm calling my parents, I am getting everybody I know aware of what's going on. I'm in the hospital, I don't care if I'm there for a week, I don't care if I'm there for a month, I don't care if I'm there for a year. The second that, that symptom shows up, I'm going to go there. And so, you know, having this symptom associated with my mental illness that I knew could come from my mental illness and hiding it from my caregivers, from my family, from the physicians who were taking care of me, to me illustrates my own stigma that I had about mental illness and my own lack of trust in these people's ability to put my interest first. Um, and I now know that, first of all, the response wouldn't have been as dramatic as I, as I feared if I had told these people about the thoughts I was having. But second of all, um, I came close to attempting suicide one day, and that wouldn't have happened if I had told people about, what it, uh, about 
what I was experiencing. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of one, one thing. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention about this and about sort of my experience is I hid my suicidal thoughts from people. I knew, I looked up online what the common symptoms of suicide, of suicidal thoughts were, and I intentionally made sure that I did not demonstrate any of those. I didn't want people to know. There were a few things I said that if people were really listening really, really closely, they, and you know, I'm sure that if I, if I had gone through with this and I killed myself, that my wife and my therapist and my parents would have all found things that I had said to them that they could trace back as evidence for what I, had said, for what I was thinking. I couldn't hide it entirely, but I did a pretty good job. And I can't speak for anybody else, but I know that I forgive my family for missing that. And I'm lucky enough to know that they forgive me for hiding it. And mental illness and illness in general life in general comes with suffering. Um, but the way to get past that suffering is to open ourselves up to forgiving ourselves and forgiving other people. So anyway, that's, that's my story. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, so, there's a few minutes left, and I do want to um, offer people an opportunity, if people have any questions, anything at all you're curious about, um, I promise I will answer. <laughs> so I'm very happy to, to do so. So um, anyway. Yeah, sure. Did you have to try different antidepressants before they worked? Yeah, I was on... Prozac for a while, and then um, uh, some SNRI that I can't even remember the name of. Um, and I, I went through like a month and a half on one thing, and a month and a half on the other thing, and a month and a half on the next thing. Um, and then in the meantime, I was on a variety. The, the, the benzodiazepines sort of help manage things for me acutely, but, um, but finding something that worked um, uh, yeah, and, and, and still, I, every day I take, I take a, a pretty low dose, but I take benzodiazepines every day. Also, what would a, like, Valium, uh, isn't it benzodiazepines, right? Yeah. What would a starting dose be for that? Oh, psh, I don't know. That's, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't even answer that. Yeah. Um, I, I, um, I guess, so what I take is clonopin, and um, it varies between, you know, my, I'm, 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 I'm take between a quarter and two milligrams a day. Most days it's a half milligram to a, a quarter to a half milligram for me, but, um, but yeah, it's variable. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did you get to refute the people who challenged your... No, no, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, for me, doing bench work is not the thing for me. And if do, refuting them would involve more bench work. I can make arguments, but actually stepping outside of the conversation for today, one of the big things um, in general with um, thinking about science is you don't win a scientific argument with, with ideas and logic. That's a part of it. You need those things. Um, but you win a scientific argument with data. And um, there are other people who are trying to refute these people, and I'm fine with that. I don't want to get into it. I, I, I still read the papers. It's not painful for me to read the papers. Um, but I, um, but I, I, somebody here, uh, Dr. Barth, has offered a few times to have me come work in her lab. And I have always politely but firmly declined that offer. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs>